really great, diverse audience. So I'm, my goal is to go through this kind of quickly and in mostly spend time in discussion, because I think that's like where the interesting parts come from. Um, and also to give you context, this is not uh, a Google talk or Google's perspective. This is uh, something that I've been working on personally for the last three years. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that story. So I, I love this image, the background here. I don't know if you can see it. It's basically a guy who's tugging at his time from all of these applications. And basically, this represents the attention economy, what I call the attention economy. And the attention economy is basically, you know, whether you're a meditation app or you're the New York Times or you're an addictive game or you're Facebook, you still fundamentally have to compete for people's attention. And the best way to get people's attention is to seduce their psychological instincts. Um, I know this because uh, I worked at a lab at Stanford called the Persuasive Technology Lab that um, basically taught students how to persuade people's psychological instincts so that you can get them to click on stuff, finish sign-up forms, keep scrolling. And my project partners in that class were the founders of Instagram. Just I always say that to sort of give that credibility. So there was this whole generation of people who, at the end of the day, if you want to be successful as a technology maker, as a civic app maker, or um, as a news website, you have to basically tap into what drives people's psychology to get them to do stuff. And that got me really concerned because uh, once you have this power and you have a small group of people who are persuading a large group of people, uh, what is the ethical responsibility or relationship that you have when you're persuading so many other people with what to do with their life. You're basically designing other people's lives. So that's some of what I want to talk about today, and I'd love to leave most questions. So I might go through this even kind of quickly. Uh, and I'm going to start by telling a story, uh, which is that about two years ago, I actually helped host a meeting between Thich Nhat Hanh, if you know who that is. Uh, he was an international spokesperson for, he is an international spokesperson for mindfulness and meditation. Um, he was uh, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1969 with Martin Luther, by, by Martin Luther King, so that puts context in history. And he's uh, sort of a Zen master meditator. And he came to Silicon Valley about two years ago because he was very concerned by what this is doing to people's brains, um, by what this is doing to people's attention. And um, he uh, you know, was coming to Google and a few other technology companies to give a talk about uh, helping people know themselves. He thought that basically the people who make the technology need to understand themselves uh, deeply and for them to be able to deeply design for other people. And uh, the people who organized his talk knew about some of the work I was doing and said, look, if you can basically find the lead designers at Google, uh, we'll give you an hour of his time. And so I ran as fast as I could and I found the lead designers of like the main products and there was this meeting between essentially nine Buddhist monks, including Thich Nhat Hanh. Like, imagine walking into a tech company conference room, and you have like nine Buddhist monks on one side of the room, and then you have a bunch of people that look kind of like us or like me, uh, you know, young 20 to 35 year old sort of designery people. And we talked for two hours about essentially human values and what does it really mean to design for the deepest human values. So this upgrades the kind of conversation that people might typically have in a tech company about just getting people to click or getting people to scroll or saying that we're gonna make the world more open and connected. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today is that basically we're only as good as the representations that we speak in and that we live by and that we measure ourselves against. So that's the theme of what I wanna to talk to you about. So what is a representation? Well, uh, how many of you are familiar with the phrase, the map is not the territory? Okay, some of you. So this comes from cybernetics and from semiotics. The, the idea is basically every map refers to some kind of underlying truth or reality. Um, but if you use the top part of this map, that's a map of reality. But it, it, it both expresses truth and lies to you because that's what every map does. Every map, and I mean this in a deeper metaphorical way, every map will express truth and lie to you because you can never capture the underlying territory of truth with maps. So what are some examples of maps? Um, or I might use the term map or representation interchangeably. Um, but a map might be a life philosophy. So someone might be saying, always say yes to opportunities, right? That's, like a, a, that's referring to some kind of underlying set of desires that a person has that are not really articulated in that, but refer to it. Um, or a metric, like gross domestic product, refers to an idea of what improving human welfare might correspond to, but doesn't have the truth of human welfare 
uh, represented by it. Uh, or a design goal, let's help people book a flight. Or a mission statement, let's make the world more open and connected. Or an idea, like choice. So choice is a map, and it refers to a kind of underlying desire or truth that we want, but it doesn't capture what really goes on in what we call choice. So I want to kind of bring this as the frame of the conversation because I think it'll help elucidate everything else. And for the first time in history, we have mostly like 50 people who eat at fancy restaurants in the Mission District of San Francisco uh, who go to work at three buses, on three buses, three types of buses, and go to three tech companies to work, and they make choices about the design of the screens in our pockets, and it affects how a billion people live. So essentially, these guys or, and ga gals um, basically are defining the representations that everyone else lives by. So they're defining the choice, the frame, the design, the rules, the competition, the medium, that then all these applications, services, websites, et cetera, compete within. And so we're only as good as the language that these guys use to think about and conceive of what designing for human values might actually look like. Uh, and I always like to say that they're kind of the inadvertent urban planners of this city, of this city of a billion people. So they sort of set, in their choices, they set the kind of distances of the, the widths of the sidewalks and whether or not you're connected to everybody or whether your text messages shows just the most important people or the most recent people. And all their little choices add up to kind of the zoning laws and the, the metaphorical parts of what makes this big city that we're all basically living in. Except, of course, it's designed by companies, not some kind of public uh, commission. So um, what I want to do is talk about the way that a design goal, the way you represent something, could have, comp um, could have consequences. So if your design goal, let's say you're building like a messaging application, and your goal is to help people send messages to each other instantly. So this is a great goal. I mean, in a world where people cannot send messages, what an amazing goal that people can send messages to each other instantly. So you can imagine a whole team of people who like go to work every day, and this is like the thing on their wall. This is what we want to do. But what might happen with that goal? Um, well, before answering that question, uh, I want to basically re replace the words good and bad in our vocabulary with three questions that you can ask of any representation, which is that if you represent this as your design goal, what kinds of activities or things in the world will that enhance or amplify? Uh, what will that suppress? And where will that be vulnerable to? So if you, if you push that to its extreme, imagine a dial and you're just pushing that to the extreme, what's going to happen in a world where people are thinking this way? Right? Well, so I'll give you an example, uh, and I'm just stealing these slides from my TED Talk. So let's imagine two people. There's this woman, Nancy, on the left, and there's this guy, John, on the right. And John remembers, I need to ask Nancy for that document before I forget. Sorry for those of you over there. Um, hopefully you can maybe see. Uh, and so what does he do? Uh, he blows away her attention, just completely bulldozes her attention. And every single time he does that, there's a huge cost of about 23 minutes that it takes us to resume focus after an interruption. Um, this is a woman uh, named Gloria Mark, who is at UC Irvine, has been studying interruption science for the last 10 years. And her research shows the second thing is that the more external you interruptions you get in an hour, if you look at the next hour of activity, people don't get any interruptions, but they, their self-interruption rate goes up. So what appears to be happening is that the more external interruptions we get, it, it sort of increases the internal clock rate of self-interruption. So in other words, there's a big cost to being interrupted all the time. So uh, how would you fix this? Well, um, I'm going to first show you a design solution. Um, let's imagine that we give Nancy like a traffic lane that says that she wants to be focused. Maybe this occurs because whenever she goes into doing her, whatever is work for her, it automatically invites her, says, do you want to be focused for you know, one hour, two hours, three hours? You say, I want to be focused for two hours. And then it tells John when he wants to send the message, he still has to get that message off of his mind, right, and hit send. Except John now knows that the messages are being held and will be delivered to Nancy as soon as she's unfocused. So there's clear communication. Nancy knows that John knows that Nancy knows, right? It's sort of the, the full loop is established. And uh, now you might be thinking now, hold on a second, I would never trust this because I'd be worried, what if I'm missing something important? Uh, and that solves too. Uh, some, uh, John still has a way of escalating a message and saying, I still would like to interrupt you, but I'm going to now make that a conscious choice. So think of it as for this period of two hours when Nancy wants to go focus, we're flipping the world upside down. And now if I want to interrupt, I can only do it consciously as opposed to accidentally. So 
I didn't sort of show you how I got to this solution, um, but effectively what this is is kind of like a traffic light in this billion city, you know, place that these designers are building, right? It's like a traffic light that's coordinating and synchronizing underlying needs of people. Um, and the, the thing I want to tell you is that we got there by asking a different question. If your design goal is to help people send messages instantly, then when people are interrupting each other, there's nothing wrong with that. Right? If, if, you are, if your North Star, if your mission statement is we're going to help people send messages instantly, then when people get interrupted all the time, that's, there's nothing that's triggering your, oh, there's a problem here. And so if you upgrade the goal to the human values, the Thich Nhat Hanh question of what does it mean for two people to understand each other, respect each other, coordinate with each other's needs. Um, he joked in our meeting, by the way, that um, instead of... Uh, a spell check, what if you had a compassion check? And so when you're writing an email and you accidentally would write something in a way that you wouldn't perceive as abrasive, uh, it would tell the other per it would let you know, like maybe in yellow, you know, do you want to change that? So again, you get to those kinds of solutions if you're actually thinking deeply, if you're representing the North Star of the good in a deeper way and asking deeper questions. So that's what I want to talk to you about. So here's another one, number of shares is popularity. So the news feed right now uh, represents popularity as the things that get shared the most are the things that should have the most attention. But this is another representation, right? So in a world where this is true, meaning let's actually even get more specific. So what is a share? Well, a share is when someone clicks the share button on a news website, right? The share button. So if news websites and everyone who's competing for attention and competing for popularity knows that sharing is the best way to get attention, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to put the share buttons at the top of the piece instead of at the bottom. And they're going to write their headline in a way or put something visual or, or expressive at the top so that it gets shared instantly without people reading it. And that's actually, in fact, exactly what happens. So Chartbeat, a company local to New York, found that um, sharing behavior is not correlated with reading time, meaning that people are just as likely to share an article before reading it than after reading it. Okay, so imagine that there's some designers working at Facebook and they don't make that distinction. They don't make a distinction between shares that happen after someone read an article and the shares that someone made before they read an article. Then their representation of popularity is impoverished. Does that make sense? Yep. So we're only as good as the way that we represent and think deeply about what sharing is for, what popularity is for. Um, another example, Hitmonk, funny example, Hitmonk, the travel website, says uh, booking a flight may not just be about price, but might be about the human experience of travel, right? Someone's making a life choice about where they want to go, and the, the prices are super important, you want to put them there, but you may, wanna, you may not want to rank the prices just by the cheapest to the most expensive, you might want to rank it by uh, the, the whole total weighted experience of travel for that human being as they're making that life choice. Uh, or another example, if you're booking a room, how many of you use like Google Calendar to like book you know, rooms in your companies? And so there's this like room selector thing, right? So this, this is putting people, this is an example where the, the designers of calendar and all calendars are kind of putting people into a representation. They're putting you into a frame that causes you to think about your time and what meeting another person is about. Specifically, it kind of puts you in the frame of, you know, uh, time is about... 30-minute slices that I can dice up and sort of throw around on a grid. That's kind of the representation that like, we don't even think about because we're in it, but that's a specific representation. And the question might be, what's the most empowering representation to people when they're making a choice about spending time together? So imagine instead of a room selector, it was trying to help you ask the question, what's the most fulfilling way for two people who want to meet to catch up with each other? And you can imagine putting dinners or walking meetings or lunches or other, you know, uh, you know, there's lots of other ways that people can sort of be together that we don't think about when we're in the moment of choice. Um, or example might be, uh, part of this is, is that software would need to know what your values are to create choice architectures that align with what you want. So let's just say that you valued exercise. Then you can imagine that the thing might say, well, here's the different subway directions for where you want to go. But also, if you said you care about, you know, walking, uh, and getting more exercise, you could also put walking on the menu so you can make a comparison in that menu. Because when we're all running and rushing from thing to thing, we're only as good as kind of the menu that's presented to us. Or, by contrast, just to make this clear, it's not a, 
a paternalistic thing. Uh, if you value productivity, you can imagine software that says, oh, like here's that podcast you wanted to finish. Here's that phone call you wanted to make. So there's every choice is sort of complicated and nuanced, and we can help people make choices one way or another. I'm, not, I'm suggesting these not as the solution, but more as an example of how to think about deep representations when you're trying to empower people to live their lives. So really, I think of wisdom as basically upgrading from simple representations to deeper representations. So for example, a person who lives their life by, and I had this once when I was like 22 years old, uh, always say yes. Like when opportunities come your way, just start saying yes to things, right? There's like an appeal to that when you're like 22 and you think that's a good way to live life. And, but that's sort of, what does that amplify? Can you imagine what would that amplify for a person? What would that suppress? What kinds of things would they not be doing or seeing? And then what would that be vulnerable to and push to the extreme? And there's sort of an upgrade you can make to a sort of different kind of discernment but openness. Or and we have a lot of times in our culture a kind of philosophy of freedom, just maximizing the number of choices. More choice, more choice, more choice. This is a great goal when people don't have choice. But there might be a different, wiser goal of a minimal set of empowering choices that cause people to not have to think deeply about comparing a million options that don't matter to them, but the minimal set of outcome-oriented choices that actually get people where they want to go. Um, or instant navigation, let's get people there fast, 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 to instead say empowered navigation. How in control do you feel? Do you actually get to where you want to go? Um, this occurs a lot, I think, in browsers, like, or you know, mobile phone home screens, where navigation is the metaphor, and we can get you there instantly but we're not caring about are you getting to where you want to go and staying where you want to go for exactly how much you, time you'd like to spend. Uh, or sex, you know, you're looking for sex, but then what you really want is good sex or a deep partner, right? Or sustainable business. A friend of mine runs um, a Seven Generation, uh, which is a home cleaning supplies company. Uh, he was the f one of the founders, and he got disenchanted with green sustainable business um, devolving into less bad business, meaning it's sustainable, it's, it's green, but it's still wasteful, it's still harming the environment, it's just harming the environment a little bit less than other business. And he said, that's a great goal in a world that doesn't have sustainable business, but let's create a new initiative called net positive business, which is something he's working on now, where you have a restorative or regenerative effect on business. Um, and you can imagine, you know, would you want a sustainable marriage or would you want a regenerative or restorative marriage, right? Would you want technology that is, that is like less distracting or do you want technology that actually net positive puts you towards the life that you want to live? So uh, one of my favorite last examples to illustrate this is couch surfing. Um, so if couch surfing was measuring its success in sort of a obvious, immediate, intuitive way, you might think that their design goal, their representation of success is let's, let's match guests to hosts. So people who are looking for a place to stay find a place to stay. But they said that's not our goal. Our goal is a deeper human Thich Nhat Hanh value, which is we want to create lasting positive experiences between people who've never met. And the amazing thing is they came up with a way to measure it. I'll just quickly describe how it works. So let's say you're meeting with someone, uh, you're staying with someone on couch surfing in Paris. Do you guys know what couch surfing is? Okay, it's like Airbnb. Um, but before Airbnb, uh, it was way bigger than Airbnb until a year ago. Uh, but it's free, and so you can just stay with people based on a reputation economy. So let's say I'm staying in Paris for four days. So what they do is they take the four days that people spent together. Th this is their, their success metric. So they say, I'm going to Paris four days, staying with someone for four days, and then they estimate how many hours would be in those four days. So how many hours would have occurred between two people in four days. And then they ask both people, how positive were those hours? So they're trying to get a concrete count of positive hours that you spent together. What's the positivity of the hours that you spent? And then what they do is they subtract all of the time that people spent on the website because that's a cost. That's all negative hours from their perspective because what they care about is the net positive new hours in people's lives, what they call it is net orchestrated conviviality, uh, or the, just really the net good times that people spent together that literally in a world without couch surfing wouldn't have happened. Can you like, see the distinction here? Like The representation that they're using for success is just much deeper, and they're caring about you actually getting closer to the life that you want to live, or having some kind of fulfilling experience that's doing something for you. So could you imagine if there was a whole world that actually worked that way? Right? Where like every technology that you used actually was built on this kind of principle, that it's trying to move you towards the life that you want to live. It's not just less distracting or notifies you less. 
It's that it actually measures its success in you getting what you came for, which raises lots of other questions. Do people know what they want, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what I want to say is there's obviously conflicts of interest here because the entire internet economy right now is measured in time spent. The way we measure success is we maximize time spent. I have to prove to my friends and my private investors and my you know, people I'm trying to impress at cocktail parties that I have an app that's getting lots of usage. I have lots of active users. I've got a billion swipes a day on Tinder. That's literally how they measure success. So we'd have to change how we value success. And that's kind of what I've been working on with some collaborators um, because we've done this in other industries with organic where we said if you want to do the thing that's good for people and you want to design what you're doing in a different way that's really about people and human values, then you need to be rewarded for it. Because if you're a farmer and some other farmers around you start putting chemicals on their products that are going to harm people, but they won't know for a long time, so they're just going to keep doing it, and it lowers the cost of that apple that they're making, then if you're the farmer who doesn't want to do that, you'll get punished by the market because you'll literally get priced out. You'll die. Until we give that farmer a seal that says this is something that's actually built for people and people can make a different choice. So we did that with, lead, with uh, organic. We also did it with lead certification. And um, we could do it with uh, technology. Uh, and how might that work? Well, doing that would account, first of all, for moving from a time spent economy to a time well spent economy. So imagine a whole services industry where people are measuring their success in helping you spend your time well according to you. Just to get that clear, there's no normative view here. Um, and uh, how might that work? Well, imagine that part of this, oops, sorry, yeah, I guess here's some distinctions. So in a time spent world, uh, here's sort of the dis a set of distinctions that, that might be helpful. In a time spent world, this is like what apps and websites sort of have as their, their current way of operating. So the stance is, it's your responsibility to get the most out of me. If I'm Facebook or Twitter or email, it's like, I'm just presenting your stuff. It's up to you to get the most out of me. Right? Um, the design goal is help people do stuff and complete tasks. Uh, the framing effects are disempowering choices that basically align with what businesses care about. So it's about getting you to click and spend as much time. So all the choice architectures are defined to fulfill the business's goals. Um, the measurement of success is all about transactions. So clicks, shares, time spent. Right? And people don't feel in control. The whole design is to make you feel not self-aware of what's doing, going on while you're using a product. Uh, and there's lots of compulsive checking that, uh, and, and external, sort of, I call them psychological externalities, that are essentially the user's responsibility. If you don't want to be anxious using my product, that's your responsibility to go meditate and quiet your mind, right? Versus, how would a time well spent world work? Well, the stance would be, it's my responsibility to help you get the most out of it. I don't know about you, but I've had like teachers in my life that you could tell when they show up and gave a lecture, they cared about you getting the most out of it versus I'm just doing my thing and it's up to you to study, right? And it feels nice when someone's caring about you. Um, and the design goal is to help people spend time well, meaning I'm, my design goal is to help you spend time in your life according to what you care about. And um, my framing, the mediums and representations I'm creating, the choice architectures I'm creating are empowering and relate to what you care about. And I rate and measure my success in terms of net positive contributions to your life. And I'm aiming to help you make conscious choices where you're in control and self-aware and I'm aiming to minimize the number of externalities psychologically and compulsive checking and addictions that, that people normally try to create. So these are some distinctions. There's more on my website. You can imagine there being a rating where you actually show people a reflection of their browsing behavior and you basically ask them, here's all the articles that you read. Which of these were time well spent? Or is there any percentage of this or some feeling about this that just didn't feel like it's what you wanted? And imagine if that score got built into you know, Facebook uh, reporting for, for websites so that you're actually your newsfeed score was impacted by your time well spent score. So imagine stock prices affected by time well spent. Um, imagine you know, in Google Analytics, publishers can basically know that, that some people don't like feel like their time is well spent on that website. And that creates a feedback loop where they have to improve it. So um, that's kind of what I wanted to give to you today. And again, we're only as good as the representations that we use in language, ideas, um, design. And for each representation, we can always ask, what will that enhance? What will that suppress? And what will that be vulnerable to when pushed to the extreme? So that's what I wanted to um, leave you with. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, 
So I'm going to take moderator's privilege for the first question and try to tease out a little more of what you were saying there about the conflict of interest. Because um, you've gone and spoken now to quite a lot of companies and a lot of designers about these ideas. And to tie this in a little bit to what we talk about here in da at Data and Society, obviously one of the reasons that the attention economy works the way it does is that a lot of these companies offer services which are, in quotes, free, which means that they're offering them to you in return for your data. Yep. They need as much of your data as possible. In order to get as much of your data as possible, they need as much of your attention as possible. Yes. And that's where one of the fundamental conflicts of interest seems to be. So how it, does that come up when you go and talk to these companies, and how do you answer that problem of their essentially their existential crisis around this? Yep. Um, so for, for businesses who, um, whose business model is engagement-based, so it, it's not just data, right? I mean, if I, don't even, if I have no data from you and I can just put an ad in front of you, I'm still, I can make money from that. Data is just the optimization on top of that to make that ad worth a lot more than what it would be if I didn't know anything about you. So there's sort of different tiers. There's an attention economy that's sort of like the 1995 attention economy where ads just show up and the goal is to get you to spend as much time as possible. But in that world, we weren't very persuasive yet at getting people to spend lots of time. Um, so for any business model, for any business, website, app, that, is, um, that has the business model of, of time spent being the proxy, uh, this, this does conflict with what they can do. So if I walked into YouTube or to Twitter or to Facebook, and I was actually speaking to Facebook's uh, whole product design team uh, two weeks ago. Uh, they can't do a lot of these changes because it would conflict with their business model. But I think the thing that I'm concerned about is whether or not that distinction ever gets made versus there's sort of a self-deception that getting people to spend more time is improving their life as opposed to we're just trying to get people to spend more time. And it, it correlates with life benefit, but it's not on my team. So you can't, you can't do it until there is some mark that basically, well, I mean, so you don't have to have the mark, but people do have to pay for, so there has to be an alternative business model or an augmentation of money coming in, which can be subscription, can be, um, uh, you know, freemium type, type models and things like that. But it's, it's the unbounded desire to take your time. That's the, that's the fundamental issue. It's not advertising at large. It's the specific form in which people have an incentive to get eyeballs glued on screens for minutes. Right, and as you say, one of the driving forces could be that there's an alternative. So as with organic food, once there is an alternative organic food industry, yeah. that in itself maybe creates a certain incentive for the other producers to shift. That's right. At the, at the very least, the way they market their products, if not actually the content. So exactly. So you've talked, I think, about the idea of a B Corp or something like that. That's kind of like what this is, yeah. Mm. It's, I right. mean, but, so it's interesting because normally B Corps and CSR programs are about um, managing the externalities that your business produces. Uh, or, or like the manufacturing practices or the operating, the, how the company operates itself. But there's not been a category for does the core thing that your product does actually result in net positive improvements to people's lives. So it's sort of a new piece of corporate social responsibility or B Corp style work. Okay. Uh, so questions. Um, I'm just going to walk around with this. Okay. Uh, so my question is, I'm just curious what your organization empowering design does and what your goals are towards getting towards this future vision? Yeah, awesome. So um, <laughs> I've, I've been working on this for a long time and uh, have gone through many cycles of not knowing what to do. Um, because this is really, I've, I always use the organic food metaphor because it, it's similar in that until organic was a, a thing, consumers didn't even know to question where their food came from. It's like, oh, food is food. Like, oh, it's an apple's an apple. I don't, it doesn't really matter where it comes from, what the supply chain looks like, um, um, how the, uh, uh, you know. So, so I think that the first part of this is that consumers need to understand what the situation is. They don't know where their technology comes from, what the goals are for many attention economy companies are. Not because those companies are evil or bad or wrong, but that's just that the, the position or contract that they're in. Um, so the first thing I think is to create a like new consumer conversation, which is basically how can we get a distribution platform of millions and millions of people who just un can be sort of led through the problem. Um, 
I've been unsuccessful at that. <laughs> I've given a TED Talk and I've done some other things. I think we need to do more. Empowering Design specifically is a resource for com a community of designers that we're trying to pull together. So almost like there was a communities of practice so that farmers who were doing the organic version of farming could come together and define what that would look like and what that would mean. So there's sort of standard practices. We kind of need something like that to teach designers. So we've actually held uh, de design meetups. We did two at Civic Hall. We've run some in Berlin and London and San Francisco trying to bring designers together to teach them what would be an empowering representation. Uh, we might actually, um, maybe we'll do one next week. I was just at Meetup yesterday, and they're interested in doing one um, uh, potentially next Thursday. So uh, if that's of interest to you, let me know, and maybe we'll, we'll organize that. But that's what that website is. You had a question? I have the mic. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I'll do it sorry. after. Um, you just addressed part of this question, but the, the word I kept thinking about is, is literacy. Mm -hmm. um, and you know a lot. So mostly, we're in the talk focused on the producer side of this. You know, what are the people who are making these things thinking about? But then you were just talking a little about the consumer side. <clears throat> and um, I'm just wondering what you think is. I, I, there's like I think two pieces of that. One is sort of a media literacy. People just being aware of, of these issues and thinking about um, the tricks that get played on them and being savvy to it. Mm -hmm. But the other side is the sort of um, I guess sort of hacker maker mentality, which is that like. Why are they building those tools for, for us? Why can't we build those tools for ourselves mm. and getting more people, um, giving more people tools and, and the power to um, do it themselves, which I think would probably not wind up with, with, with you know, products like that. It, the challenge with doing it ourselves um, is that so much of the things that we'd want to change, there, there's a few problems. One is which we don't have control to create a marketplace of, of tools that sit between you and some of these problems. Right, like um, Apple, for example, locks down the lock screen, so you can't change how your basic phone screen works, which means that everyone's just in a bind. So the only innovation or kind of cool independent hacker stuff you can do is after that step. But the core problems are actually at the very, very root of the screen. And so I think there's almost like a missing, this is sort of what I meant by a universal right to your attention. Or there's like a, a missing area of freedom that people should have to be able to affect or do this sort of innovation at this, these core interfaces. Email or social networks are also like that, right? Text messaging, you, you can't, um, you could start a new text messaging network, but there are network effects of the existing ones that everyone does rely on. And to, to modify, what ideally you would want is to modify those. So for example, the chat example I gave of focus mode, you know, you could say, oh, that's cool, I'll build an app that does that. No, it has to be built into one of the major platforms at the, like, the root of it. And so that's why I think this is a, we need to demand changes from you know, the, the bigger players, unfortunately. There are some areas where some small things can help. I think like, people can innovate in calendars, and um, there's some other smaller opportunities, but the big areas I think we need to affect the, unless people are going to start a new mobile phone handset company, and that, that's another thing. Hi. Um, I feel like there are uh, two things that you um, talked about. First, kind of the demand side where you want consumers to go to the time well spent websites or apps, for instance. Another one which would be the supply side. Try to uh, give incentives to the businesses to become more focused on time well spent. Mm -hmm. And so you talked about um, CSR, for instance, and you have now investors like hedge funds, for instance, who yep. want to invest Investing. only in CSR's yep. um, businesses. And so but to do have that, they need to have a label, but also kind of an index. And so you talked about yep. in Google Analytics having an index. And I'm thinking about the GDP anal analogy mm -hmm. that you gave. And one of the problems with GDP is that nearly all economists, like, contr on the contrary to what Nearly everyone thinks all economists know it's a bad measure, but we have, well, we, I used to do economics, so. <laughs> um, we haven't found a good way to measure it, to measure something more um, comprehensive than GDP. Even all the indexes that we have are either too subjective or really difficult to compute, and so we still rely on GDP. We know it's a bad one, but it's the only one, still now we haven't found a, an objective definition of happiness that could be this great index. And so do you have an idea of what kind of index could be used? Yeah. And thank you. Well, so this goes back to the, the very first point, right, which is that all maps are never the territory. And, and the, the critical thing is, that is there a self-awareness or doubt or questioning about what the vulnerabilities of this particular map that we're using, which could be GDP or it could be an idea or a design goal, what that goal might be vulnerable to. 
Um, so that's the first thing. Whatever we come up with, we would know would never capture the underlying territory of net positive human impact. I could name a billion ways of describing that, and it would never capture what was true for everybody. Um, but the whole point of that last slide was that there are upgrades we can make, and there are certainly certain ways of measuring that that might be better than the current way. Uh, currently, I think the way to measure time well spent, and I'm kind of like, there's a, a collaborator of mine in Berlin who's been working on this. He was the CTO of Couchsurfing who um, is responsible for that metric I showed you. And he's working on a Chrome extension that basically shows people a reflection of your use. So it says, okay, here's the websites you used a bunch. And then it asks you some questions about whether or not you got what you came for um, and, and tries to get at what a time well spent score looks like. The best way to do this is not to have me or my friend Joe or anybody say we know what the answer is, it's to have like a consortium of people who are sort of experts in uh, subjective well-being, which is a whole area of psychology and behavioral economics and, um, you know, the people who are experts in those measures to come together and try to create that standard. And it should be a, obviously a nonprofit that, um, uh, or some kind of benefit type oriented entity that is all about measuring that in a standardized way so that you can create these new standard metrics. Um, but really important point, to do that, you would need a reflection of what people are currently spending time on. I can't rate what I've, how I feel about something unless I see what, I, what I've been doing. So there's a key area of missing freedom here too, which is that um, there's no way for, uh, especially on an iPhone, on any iOS device, to get back all the time that I spent across the different things. There's no way to see, to pull that data out. So there's a missing like data freedom about where was my usage or time spent on my phone. I can't get that. Um, you could hack it on Android. Uh, it'd be nice for some people to help do that. Uh, it'd be nice to do this across, uh, to unify the data picture from Chrome and web other web browsers so that you can basically pull it all into one unified package. Someone needs to know that Facebook wasn't just the Facebook app use, it was the website use and it was the tablet browser use and you have to be able to unify all that together. And so one problem is we don't have the ability to pull that data together because there's actually missing freedoms that the platforms aren't giving people. That would be part of the list of demands of sort of a, a, a time well spent movement, right? Um, is we need to be able to have the basic data so then we can ask questions. In the meantime, there's some smaller things you can do like showing people a reflection of their web usage and ask people just to get some baseline number of how that feels so far. And then once you had that, like you said, to make it actionable, the idea is not that there's this app store where suddenly a person's about to pick up an app and look at it. Oh, that doesn't have the label. I want the one that has the label. It's not that. It's the idea that in your experience of the internet, things are automatically marked and reorganized according to time well spent preferences. So it's not like you're doing this extra conscious choice making work. It's like the world is working for you based on the data that exists about what does improve people's lives. I hope that answers your question. Well, I want to live oh, in yeah. that world. That sounds yeah. amazing. Um, <laughs> I know this sounds utopian, by the way, but I, I'm trying to anchor at utopia so that when we get back to the things that we could do, it would be practical. But. Yeah. Uh, loved your presentation. I especially like the framework and your analogy of imagining this community landscape with the stoplight, and it made me think of this recent essay that came out um, by Umar Haik, which is Why Twitter's Dying, mm. and it's all about online harassment, and so, and, mm. you know, it's a good phrase. <laughs> uh, and thinking about online harassment, and your analogy is really like being verbally harassed on the street or threatened, mm. um, and I had a very um, personal example happen this morning with, with one of uh, Reported Girl's story contributors. It was not on our platform, but on a separate space, um, some really heavy victim blaming, minimization from this male individual towards one of our story contributors. And I, I reached out to her, she lives in Tanzania right now, but she told me she had a panic attack because of it. Mm. And so my question is sort of, you know, from your perspective, how can you imagine <clears throat> um, putting that lens to harassment? Totally. And um, yeah. I have a concrete example of that. Um, Facebook actually has a team I'm not, by the way, anti-Facebook in, in any way. They actually have a really great team uh, that, um, uh, I forgot what they call it. They used to call it the compassion team, and then they got in a lot of trouble because people wanted to know what that meant. Um, I think they now call it like the trust and safety team. And there's a guy named Arturo Bihar who basically worked, he integrated all the principles of nonviolent communication and compassion and the Greater Good Science Center in Berkeley, which does positive psychology research and found out that they could, there was a lot of cyberbullying going on within Facebook. So specifically teenagers uh, 
take post photos of friends they're trying to humiliate and then tag them in those photos. And then uh, the person who is tagged and wants that photo taken down <laughs> hits report photo and it creates this huge volume of customer service requests for Facebook. Um, so what his team did is they basically used the principles of nonviolent communication so that when the person says report photo, uh, it asks that person first, how did that make you feel? <laughs> which is the first step of nonviolent communication. And once they got that, then they had a pre-populated message that basically took, kind of, it sort of like helped them assemble a way of talking to that person who was the bully. And they were able to increase the takedown rate of photos by like 70%. And they also cut customer service um, inquiries by a huge amount. I, don't quote me on 70%, I don't, you can look it up. But the idea was that there are principles that are sort of social design principles, very similar to what I'm doing here. The, the idea with the chat is that there's an underlying preference between two people. People don't want to, uh, you know, it's not that I always want to interrupt you and that I want to ding you in the head every single time I have something to say. It's that I didn't know that you have some underlying preference and I didn't know your state. And I also, and the other person, like, want to know if I'm missing something important. But if you can gather that underlying preference and then, like, help coordinate a better way of both people communicating, that's really what marriage counselors and couples counseling and nonviolent communication are about. So I think there are some design principles that would be included, or should be included in some kind of empowering design framework that says there's a whole social part of empowering design that's about basically a print, like applying nonviolent communication principles to software. And that should get up, someone should do that for comment sites and a whole bunch of things like that. Hi, um, oh, okay, sorry. Hi, I just wanted to, tell, to say first that I appreciate you know, the focus on the user and you know, the effort to construct systems that are sensitive to the user's desires and needs. Um, but I wanted to ask a question that I think it might sound mean and I don't want for it to, but I want right. to push you a little bit on the idea of empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, so when I heard that you were going to talk about empowering design, this is not honestly what I thought empowerment was about. Mm. Um, because, well, there, I, I think there's kind of two things that can happen, right? One thing is that em the empowerment as you describe it, like most of the examples that you've given are in the context of like white collar work. Right, like I want to set up a meeting, like I don't want to bother this person asking for a report while they're checking their email, mm -hmm. right? Or like, oh, maybe we want to burn a couple extra calories, you know, walking around. Like it assumes a subject who's like a very particular kind of subject, right? Somebody who has presumably a lot of autonomy and freedom in their work already, you know, who like where those are the concerns, those are the big concerns are like, am, am I getting an email I don't want right now? Um, so that's like one possibility is that this is just not relevant to mm -hmm. a large swath of people. Then the other possibility that worries me more is that there's a very fine line between personalization um, and like prescription and paternalism mm -hmm. and choice making for people, yep. like in the name of empowerment. I'm sure this is something you've thought about like extensively. I'm not trying to say that this isn't no, that's something that's within your ambit, but right, like we see this a lot where first of all, personalization by default requires a lot more surveillance and data collection from people. Mm -hmm. um, and this almost always happens in an imbalanced way. Right, so that people who are marginalized or disempowered get more data collected about them in the name of some public good. So, like the the most, the best example of this I can think of is this medical program actually, where we know that like women who speak to their babies a lot, mm. like those babies do a lot better. So, like mm -hmm. the big like Silicon Valley bright idea was like, well, let's start rec like recording, like everything that happens in these women's homes, so that we know like so that we can help them. Right, we can empower them to make better choices and say more words out loud, right? Like forgetting mm -hmm. that this involves basically just like wholesale surveillance of these women. Mm -hmm. So I'm really worried about that line. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I mean, in some ways it, it's akin to what Adam suggested about like who's making the choices, right? Like you s displayed this slide of these four bearded young Brooklyn guys making <laughs> choices and like you're kind of also just like I, a bearded, I mean. I always make that, like no yeah, totally. <laughs> you seem like a good dude, right? But like. I feel like you always are going to run into that, right? Mm -hmm. When like the people making the design decisions are making them for someone else. Exactly. Yeah. So many good points you're bringing up. So, um, so one thing obviously is that those people who work at those tech companies who make those choices, they can't not make that choice. There's, there's no way I can't be like, I'm not, I'm not going to make a choice. Um, what's viewed as paternalism is often just moving away from whatever was before. It's sort of like new, no it's a, uh, there's a cognitive bias there. I forgot what it's called. It's basically when we assume that how things were when we first just accidentally or intuitively made some choice was like better than anything we might change it to. Um, and so as soon as you want to change it, it's like, well, who are you to say that, um, who are you to say that that's better for people? Um, so, uh, you know, and then you're bringing up another important point, which is that you're right, that basically, let's see. 
So the frame for what you're talking about is fundamentally that there is a finite amount of choices people can make in a day. So one way to view this entire problem is there's a finite amount of time or attention. Another way to view it is there's a finite amount of choice-making energy people have. So that's why choice is like high. It's a representation that's both uh, hinting at truth but then lying to us, right? Because I can saturate you with choices and then I'm just burning you down and then you're basically just like running with the default choices of the world and that's actually how a lot of people in the world get impoverished because you just burn people down so they have nothing left and all they can do is reach for the easy thing. Um, and the, so, so there's something that Cass Sunstein, who's the Obama's behavioral economics advisor and wrote Nudge, calls uh, choices about choices or meta choice design, where designers have to be in the position of making choices about which choices you should have and which choices are not important to you. So to address your point about empowering what empowering means, um, I totally see that that's a, a word that hints at lots of hint, like scatters across lots of different domains that, that are not um, that might be ambiguous. But the idea of empowering choices is that uh, of the choices we are putting in front of you, they're the ones that matter to that person's life. And it certainly isn't white collar work and whether or not it's like a walking calorie counter or something else, right? It's like the idea that the person who most needs to uh, who there's like there's a simple savings account that someone might want to open, but they're just so burned down and distracted by all this other noise that they don't even like have that choice on life's menu uh, because of their environment that they're in or something like that. Um, so there, there are definitely smaller sets of empowering choices that relate to core needs that, that your phone could be putting in front of you. This start probably already sounds paternalistic. It's not where I'm intending. What I meant to say is that there's, there's fundamentally um, sets of choices that we are going to put in front of you. And by doing so, we're going to be crowding out other choices. So there has to be a discussion and some transparency about which choices we will put in front of you. Uh, the last thing, uh, which is a really important point you brought up about this new social contract, that to put empowering choices in front of you, I probably have to know more about you, not less about you. Or be more like me, or like I should see you representing you, or like a woman, or yep. color. Right, Abs yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it requires more empathy. So if I don't have information about you, it just requires lots of empathy and pre-planning on the, on the part of the designer, not knowing if they don't have personal data. If they do have personal data, they can tune those choices to be more appropriate for that person what they're after. But again, then you ask into, you know, do people even know what they want in the first place? And they don't. And so, I mean, a lot of people don't. Um, so uh, this is at least the counter criticism I get a lot. It's like, well, who are you to say? Because or people won't even know what, they're, what, they'll, what they'll want out of these services, so you have to make a choice on, on behalf of them anyway. I want to get to his question, though. But, uh, or, question oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little more about how you imagine the business model working for news organizations with this, because I feel like at news organizations, we're not even at the time spent economy in so many cases. We're on the click economy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I've worked at organizations that will remain nameless, uh, where, you know, They've explicitly prioritized writing five short articles over yep. one 2,000 word feature. Yep. Um, so I, fe I feel like editors at news organizations would actually be thrilled if they could monetize time yep. spent mm -hmm. um, and you know, actually get paid more from advertisers for feature articles um, than short news hits. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first part. And then like, what, what does time well spent add for news organizations? Mm -hmm. And how would that work? So you're bringing up a great point, which is there's this representation that's essentially the power system of news. And the power system of clicks yields very different results than a power system of time spent, than a power system of time well spent. So in a power system of clicks, people will have to do, there'll be the race to the bottom of the brainstem to get whatever makes clicks happen, which means shorter articles, slideshows instead of long posts, uh, share buttons at the top, et cetera. In a, um, I'm, I'm curious, though, what, what you mean, because I know that Chartbeat and a lot of the news organizations, which I have some familiarity with, um, are migrating towards like overall engagement time spent on the course of the website, just because that... Are you talking about advertiser clicks or the... Right, but there are some correlations around, like, if you're spending, if you're just, like, briefly popping in and popping out, advertisers view that site as less compelling or less engaging, and so they tend to value those CPMs less. But um, anyway, um, so in terms of actually changing that, like, the idea of a time well spent world would be a person sort of filling out some profile of their what time well spent means to them. Um, 
which could include, for example, weight classes of articles. So for example, right now, there's this sort of like everyone's competing. Imagine like a wrestling match where like the skinniest scrawny guy is always competing with like the biggest guy who's like super big and heavy or something. Like it's sort of like not the right comparison to be making. Similarly, if you're the journalist who wants to write the 25 minute long story that you really want to do the deep research for, you will totally get killed by the internet economy if that's what you're doing with your website. So imagine though that that person can say, I'm actually a time well spent um, news site for 25 minute, you know, long, long form articles. And then people, when there's sort of a reflection of their behavior, it sort of says, you know, here's how much is happening in, you know, two minute soundbite articles. Here's how much is happening for you. Like here's where you're spending your time right now. And two minute soundbites, here's what here's you're spending your time in, uh, you know, five minute articles. And here's where you're spending your time with the long reads or whatever. What is time well spent for you? And then once you say that preference, these, 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 lo these publishers that are doing the thing that they would think is good for people, that would be time well spent for the 25 minutes, suddenly th get thrown into that person's feed. So you can imagine like creating distinctions that don't exist, weight classes for, for content. Um, that's one thing. Um, but it also, of course, it's not just about the length, it's about what are people after. So am I after understanding Syria? It's like, well, I'm after understanding Syria and understanding Syria in a deep way, and I want to spend like 45 minutes on that this week or something like that. Well, the person can say, maybe you should actually not even be on the internet. Here's this like great person you should talk to that's next to you, right? And that's what time well spent is the global set of choices that would be best for you to help fulfill what you're after, which could include in many cases, not the screen, just to be super clear. This isn't just about optimizing the screen. It's about whatever would be best for that person for the thing that they're after. Sorry, it's my fault for speaking so long for each answer. But. So, uh, thank you. That was, a <clears throat> excuse me. that was a great, wonderful presentation. I wanted to offer a um, thought on the idea of maybe uh, something you might call algorithmic fiduciaries. Mm. And I'm thinking of, uh, if you think about the, one of the challenges we have in some of the questions is the issue of that kind of subjective to objective movement, kind of the group privacy idea, right? My individual, is it sufficiently represented? My individual interest and group interest. And we have so many in groups, you have so many overlying agenda that's often hard to map it directly. What I'm wondering is if you look at um, perhaps what you're describing, and the gentleman over here was talking about gross domestic product, in market economies we do have a service layer now of fiduciaries. So investment advisors under the 40 Act are fiduciaries, broker dealers aren't. Lawyers have an ethical construction where they're supposed to act on behalf of their clients, for instance. Right. It feels like what you're talking about is anticipating yeah. an idea really an algorithmic or fiduciary layer where privacy and individual interests are represented, That's right. you're always going to have that issue of the representation doing a form of abstraction as violence to a person yep. and for non-physical violence, privacy violence. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if that's something that it feels like it's a, that it does feel like a comfortable fit in terms of that notion of a, essentially an algorithmic fiduciary that's being offered here. So you're saying basically there be there should be some way of encoding that this uh, if a time well spent if Facebook says I'm, I'm time well spent now it has to prove its fiduciary. Doing it by Prior to your interest. I, I think you're doing it by having asking people, was this good for you? And so right. essentially you're saying intrinsically, yes. you think of all of the people who earn money, so it's hard-edged market stuff, yeah. but they earn money on how well they do representing the interests of others. That their job is that's, not to represent, that's a conflict of interest right. issue, of course. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, totally. I mean, and, and like you're saying, it's sort of show, don't tell. So you're doing it by the practice of it, not doing it by the claiming of it. So one is like, oh, I can claim that I'm aligned for you. This is what happens already today. People at Facebook or at other companies, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm just helping people live their life. And what does that mean? So I think part of this is, is uh, you should be, in a time well spent world, you're transparent about what that report looks like. So there's a transparent um, way that you're saying, if I, if I am measuring your outcome, here's how I'm doing it. Uh, there's a, a issues there about whether or not you can disclose the performance of that because that can make people look bad. So we don't want to shame companies who might not be very good yet, but who are measuring it. So I think, like, I mean, one thought I had was like, there should be a time well spent index of just showing all these companies how they're measuring net positive improvement to people's lives. Here's Couchsurfing's way. You know, Flux, the thing that removes blue light from your screen late at night that helps you sleep better. That's 15 minutes times 15 million users equals this many hours of new positive sleep in the world. Um, you know, so they, they've, they've, there's, there's companies that do have metrics like that. There's not that many, but part of what this would be is like, how can we put them together so they have a shared voice? Yeah. Um, one other thing I should mention is, um, uh, well, sorry, more questions. I, yeah. Hi, I study learning, and so I see a lot of these tech fixes in the learning context, and a lot of well-meaning um, implement um, interventions in tech. And I guess my question is, are we looking? It seems that we're considering that 
human problems have tech fixes. And that, and that seems to be an assumption, that if we don't know how to spend our time well, there, there must be a tech fix for that. Mm. And what I've seen in learning um, that is a concern for me is that um, what ends up happening is we reduce the problem down to what can be measured by tech and what can be addressed by tech. Yep. And so I was just wondering how you were thinking about that. Totally. So just to be super clear, um, you're bringing up some great, great points. Uh, uh, I, this might sound like, oh, we just need technology just running everything every moment is helping people spend time well. Um, that, that's, that's not quite what this is about. It's really, it's just, I mean, it's about what would be best for that person to accomplish what they're after. So if, if you're trying to learn, like I said before, about Syria, and there's like these New York Times articles, and New York Times is like, no, I'm great for people learning about Syria. But maybe the thing that works best is that person talking to their like Syrian um, neighbor that's down the street or something like that. Um, so what, what the idea would be that you, you know, ideally you're ranking things by what just most fulfills that process for that person, which is not technology oriented. Um, but I did want to say something about, you are mentioning um, that we need, the, the view that we need technology to solve these problems. Um, one thing that gets missed in these conversations is people say, well, hold on a second, shouldn't people just make their own choices and self-regulate? Isn't it up to them to self-regulate their willpower and their choices because like they're in charge? And every single time there's a lapse in willpower or self-regulation, people are like, oh, that's just that's my fault. As opposed to, do we realize there's a hundred of the smartest engineers, statisticians, designers on the other side of the screen whose job it is every day is to break that. So you can meditate all you want, but the job of all those people is to break whatever you cultivate. And so that's, that's a huge power imbalance, right? And so when we make this a question of like, individual choice making, that actually is the thing that's being kind of compromised, is autonomy. Like, the ability to have a meaningful choice making environment that honors your autonomy, that, that is informing your choices, that is setting up menus that are not just drowning you in more and more choices, but like a minimal set of empowering choices that align with what you actually want, um, or what would be good for that person or that student in that environment. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I don't, hopefully that sort of gets at some of the things. I mean, I, like, Learning, I, I'm not proposing that there should just be like learning apps everywhere or something like that, just to be super clear. There are, I, know, I know there are. That's part of what I'm trying to address, because what happens there is that you have learning tech companies that throw around nice sounding catchphrases about how we're revolutionizing learning, and where's the check and balance saying that that's good? I mean, that, that's actually happening for people, and that that's better than something else that just could be a human to human connection. Hi. Um, I'm way back here. So in some ways, I'm going to be asking, I think, the same question again, but I wanted to bring it back to where you started, which was with um, BJ Fogg and persuasive tech. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think, so I've read some of that stuff, and I think it's really fascinating and really prescient if you've read the stuff that he wrote, like pre-iPhone that talks about, uh, you know, cell phone stuff. But um, so one of the things that I'm wondering, though, is that in a lot of that work, uh, it's sort of talking about the way that you can address um, sort of much more basic needs, right? So it's saying like, you know, you want to become healthier. How can you sort of harness the power of this thing that you carry around with yourself all the time mm -hmm. um, to do that? And I, I think for me, this goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And I think that a lot of the things that you've been talking about are much more towards the top of that pyramid, right? So they're much more about, you know, self-actualization, about, mm -hmm. you know, self-esteem, about love and belonging, and much less about these much more basic needs that I'm hearing some questions from the audience about, about like safety mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just your, your basic surviving and being in the world. Um, and so I'm wondering if sort of from that lens you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think I just did a bad job of choosing examples. Um, I, I, I'm not, I, I totally see how there's this perception of like, look at the white guy with the beard who's the Brooklyn guy who's talking about like fancy examples of people having the highest form of self-actualized you know, needs. Um, so that's just a, a bad call that I'm making. Um, I think that there's lots of... So I, my, I have friends who are in the behavioral economics. I'm friends with all the people who are doing behavioral economics interventions in the world. So Dan Ariely, who wrote Predictably Irrational, if many of you know that book. Um, you know, the woman who works with him is a close friend of mine. And they're doing all these interventions at lower levels of the stack of choice architectures and persuasion to do things like prize-linked savings accounts. So that when you put money in a savings account, it actually, they're using a slot machine 
reward mechanic so that when you put a little bit of money in, every time there's a chance you could get a lot more money for your savings account. And this turns out to like totally increase like rates of savings for people. And that sounds like, well, that's manipulative. You're manipulating what people are, are saving. But this is, again, every environment. There is no world in which there's not persuasion. So the question is, how would you certify that this persuasion is in my interest, that it has that fiduciary responsibility that he was talking about? Um, so, uh, you know, I think in the future, w I'm, I'm just taking a point to, to use examples that will be more in the domain of maybe human-to-human -human empathy and, and harassment issues um, and ways that your, your, the basic screen on your phone could actually just help you create space. Like one thing I'm not showing is examples I have elsewhere where, y you know, your phone cannot be amplifying the technology in your life, but actually like inviting you, do you want to disconnect? Um, so for example, when you go to bed late at night, willpower is like the lowest right before going to bed. And your screen could be like, do you want to uh, start your shutdown routine for like for going to bed? And when you do that, it puts you into this sort of like linear mode of like first you set your alarm, second uh, it uh, it asks you like you set it your own routine. It like, meets like your intentions for tomorrow. And the third thing is the phone just turns off, so it prevents that like going to those apps that you don't want to be going to late at night, right? And that's sort of like there's there's a whole bunch of design patterns that are about simple things like that, like better sleep, you know. Uh, creating more space to focus, things like that, that I think would benefit people. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna suggest as well that there's something in this movement that could be seen to reflect the kind of the relationship between Silicon Valley and and government, the sort of the, the whole libertarian issue in the UN, United States, because you know most government policy that isn't passing laws to prevent you from doing things is about persuasion. Yep. It's about the taxes that are charged, it's about the urban spaces that are created, right. it's about, it's all about incentivizing people to do things in different ways. Yep. Uh, and so it seems as if there's an argument coming out of a place like Silicon Valley that says something like, uh, we might know better than the government does what is best for people. And maybe they're right. I mean, maybe, you know, the, the tech companies have certain better techniques for getting more granular about what people want, and at the same time, they have more powers. I mean... And they're only going to be as good as whatever representations are running in their brain when they're thinking about that. Right, right. And, and, and uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say that there's a, at least with government, there's public transparency and accountability about, we're about to enact this bill that's going to do this thing to credit card bill sign-up systems. And so now, people who sign up for a credit card, the default choice will be this instead of this, and that's transparent, even though it gets drowned out in our current media environment. Whereas in this case, literally, people are making these choices every day and affecting what billions of people do, um, and there is no transparency. Because to, do, to show it would be to uh, also reveal trade secrets. And one last thing I want to say, because this is the Big Data, uh, Data Society Institute, issues like surveillance and privacy and things like this get a lot of attention right now. Because they automatically tap into another cognitive bias that you have, which is the moral trigger of like someone is, is like spying on me. right? And so we automatically freak out and care about that. But no one cares about hidden power that actually is affecting your day-to-day -day experience of life, minute to minute. Like we're probably 30% of your day might get spent on in front of a screen, and no one's questioning the fact that like this is deeply affecting your life, and it's not necessarily what you know where you want to go. And we can change it. And so I think that this is an underrepresented issue in the sort of space of issues that often get talked about. Um, I just want to leave you with that because I think that's uh, an, an important thing to kind of like. To amplify, uh, and according to the others, it had the same ranking as privacy and surveillance and other big topic issues. I'm actually going to ask you to leave us with one more thing. Just take one more minute. And so there's a kind of theory of change that you've alluded to various parts of throughout the talk. So I don't know if you want to just kind of summarize, like what are the yeah. bits and pieces that have to happen in right. your view for this to become a new paradigm? Yeah. Um, thank you for asking to do that. I love your help. Um, I don't know what I'm doing. This is not me. This is like at all. This is just uh, I, I um, care about a lot, a lot of this, and I kind of want to pull together the people that care about it to, to be working on it. Um, what needs to happen? Well, I want to make a distinction first between two levels of actors. So there's the actors that are in the attention economy. So there's like the Facebook and the Twitter and YouTube and the people who are in the attention economy and their shareholders depend on them to maximize the amount of engagement that they do. They can't escape that game. That's one set of actors that there's some change that can happen there, which I'll get to. The other set, though, are the access portals through which you access the attention economy. So these are neutral access portals, which are your mobile phone, your web browser, and the neutral uh, messaging applications that you might use, so email and text messaging. So neutral and heavy scare quotes for all of these, obviously. What's that? Neutral and heavy scare quotes for all of these things. Neutral, yeah, I didn't mean neutral in terms of not biased. I just meant that, um, so to put it more, more specifically, 
your mobile phone manufacturers don't spend, don't require you to spend every minute of your life on your mobile phone screen. Um, they, uh, they don't make money from every minute that you spend on that screen, the people who make that. Same thing with your browser. It's not like Safari or Internet Explorer makes more money the more time you spend in your browser. They're just designed in a slightly less empowering way right now that's not giving you as much control as you might like about where you spend your time. Same thing with your mobile home screen. So from the biggest access portal actors, um, we can demand design changes that put you in more control of how you spend your time and what's coming at you, and demanding new standards. To do that, people don't know how to demand for that because they've never seen what that looks like. So we need to basically show a picture of what that looks like, increase the awareness for consumers that that's possible, and then the, the big companies can respond to that need. So right now, what's happening with privacy? Privacy is a fire, so Apple and Google and the big companies are like having to respond to that. They have to respond to that because that's a fire that they have to put out. So this is not a fire, so people at the biggest companies are not changing the mobile phone screen and the browsers to, to fix it. So if this wants to be changed, we have to basically make it an issue, like a consumer issue, just like organic was, um, to, to change those, those access portals. That's like the easier short-term thing to do. And, and then that includes this, demanding transparency for user data and things like that. That could include those kinds of things too, yeah. Right. Um, so that, that, so the, the theory of change is, Consumers need to understand the problem that this is happening and why it's happening to them. Consumers need to demand a set of changes from the access portals. And then the access portals can change and improve the design to help people be more in control of their attention and their time. All right. Thank you very much, Tristan. Cool. Thanks. <laughs>